Welcome to another episode of Curious Mike. I am here with Lana Rhodes. Um, yeah, so people are going to be surprised that we're on a podcast together. Um, but I actually came across one of your podcasts that you used to do because um, I was messing with one of your friends. And she <laughs> sent me the podcast and you were talking about just the dark sides of the adult film industry and, and, the, and the porn industry. Um, which you used to be a part of and it really just I was really interested and honestly like inspired by your story So that's kind of why I want to have you on and um, I appreciate you being vulnerable and coming on the podcast No, thank you that's um, so sweet. Yeah, not for sure. So let's start off just with your childhood. I feel like um, a lot of people who end up in The sex industry at all kind of have an unorthodox kind of upbringing was yours a usual Upbringing or how'd that go growing up? Um, so there's a lot of things that I've come to terms with recently that I didn't even realize were wrong in my childhood. Yeah. Like the past year, I've started going to therapy and I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And I, um, like I've been through so many things that I was like, oh, maybe this caused it or this caused it. Yeah. And the one thing that like really, um... I feel like if you don't have borderline BPD, like you won't understand the feeling. Mm -hmm. But basically to figure it out, I had to go back and think, when was the first time that I had this feeling that like no one loves me and just like overwhelming emotions to the point where it feels like you have to like hurt yourself in mm -hmm. some way. And so that was... Um, came from just like when you're a young child and you're developing your um, like attachment to parents or emotional regulation skills mm -hmm. if people invalidate you like say you're crying and your parents like yell at you to make you stop or they hit you um, and I'm talking like two three years old like obviously you shouldn't be you should never hit your kids and mm -hmm. um, it can cause that and I just had no idea like I actually thought that everyone's parents hit them and like I really thought that I thought maybe like it just started young doing it yeah. and I asked a couple of my friends I was like how how old were you when your parents hit you for the first time and they're like what my parents never hit me mm -hmm. um so like there's just there's just like a lot and then I have a sister who has schizophrenia too mm -hmm. so I feel like I wasn't dealt like the best hand of cards when it right. comes to like family circumstances, which definitely contributed to the decisions that I made when I was older, because if your brain is just like completely like warped from going through so much, like going through certain things can actually change um, your brain chemistry and, 100%, yeah. and damage it. Um, and so I, I don't think that I would have made the decisions that I made if I was in a better um, state of mind. Because right. I only was in the industry for a short period of time. And that was because I finally was able to like get away from where I was living and like be separated mm -hmm. and live my own life and experience the world and kind of like heal because I wasn't in that constant. Right. Was there, did you have your father around or no? Um, no. My, so my parents got divorced when my mom was pregnant with me. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, obviously like growing up was tough. I had a, I had a, a woman on the podcast who also, she kind of ended up in, in the industry. She actually was trafficked. Um, and she had a similar childhood. I don't think she had a father figure around and you know, her upbringing wasn't the best and it led her to hanging around some people and idolizing certain things. And she ended up, you know, in a really messed up situation. So, um, you know, you go through that childhood and then I think your teenage years is when you kind of started getting into the to the to the industry. How did that kind of unfold? Like, what was the steps that you took to even, you know, get into that? Um. well, yeah, it was kind of like a, a progressive, like, ladder effect. I started out working at, like, a restaurant similar to Hooters mm -hmm. when I was 17. Um, and it's not that I don't, like, know my dad at all. I just don't spend a lot of time with him. Um, but he, like, signed the paper so that I could work there because it's, like, a restaurant where you have to wear, like, a sexy outfit, and I wasn't even 18. Right. Um, 
So that was like my first like kind of job where men sexualize you and look at you in that way. And I never thought that I was like pretty or anything growing up. So it was, I was like, wow, they hired me here. Like mm -hmm. I'm pretty enough to work here. And then like guys giving, like coming up to me and giving me $20 and being like, you're so hot, here's $20. It was just like, it was so weird to me, but also validating because I didn't have that self-esteem. Right. So I kind of went further down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> when I turned 18, I left that job and I went straight to becoming a dancer at a club. Um, and then after that, it was porn. Right. And I don't want to spend too much uh, time kind of in that in that period of your life, which is a very brief period. I think uh, total, you said you filmed around eight months? Total? Yeah, like two, four month stints. Got you. What I really kind of want to get at is... <clears throat> The fact that, you know, in terms of being a, a porn star, like you had everything that any girl in that industry would want. You know, you got the fame, you got the popularity, yeah. probably were making more money than most girls. Um, and you kind of threw that all away and now are kind of an advocate like against a lot of the stuff. And you speak openly and you're very passionate about kind of what goes on in the in the, in the dark sides of the porn industry and how it's not everything kind of isn't as it seems. Um, so what kind of brought about your change in perspective? Um, just, <clears throat> I actually had an experience last, so I started doing OnlyFans again. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience last night with another girl that reminded me of how I felt in those times. So, um, it's like, I actually couldn't sleep last night because I was just so hurt by this happening. Mm -hmm. Me and one of my good girlfriends, um, we went live on OnlyFans last night. And I just like recognized this facial expression that she had that she looked so uncomfortable. And this was our third time doing it. Like we're friends, like we like kiss off camera and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't expecting it, but I was like, are you okay? Like, are you comfortable? And she's like, oh, I just have anxiety. And then she like went off to the side and started just bawling. Mm -hmm. And I turned the live off. And it's just such, like, I feel honestly destroyed that I even, like, had, like, any part in someone feeling um, not comfortable with what they were doing. And also, like, she was explaining to me that, like, she needs to make money for certain things. So she feels like she like she doesn't say no to all the things that she would want to and mm -hmm. it's probably good that this experience happened with me because i have been through that so much myself that i was able to give her really good advice mm -hmm. even though it's something that like literally killed me inside right. to be part of um but that's essentially what it was is it's a bunch of really young girls who get into the industry like the younger the better for them these girls like when i started i looked like a little kid Mm -hmm. Like I looked like a little kid, um, and that's what they—that's what they like. That's what sells. And <clears throat> a lot of girls, even my friends, we don't feel comfortable saying no for some reason, and mm -hmm. because um, we just—I don't know—it's just like a natural girl thing. I think we're taught as children to like be obedient especially to like men or like if you're raised in a religious family like it's always like obey your father stuff like that and so it's, it's a really big problem with girls feeling pressured by like agents who don't necessarily have their best interest in mind mm -hmm. and um end up doing a lot of things that that really hurt them like for me there are certain scenes that i did that i I felt like I didn't say anything to them because it's work and I wanted to be professional. But for example, when the camera would be behind me and you couldn't see my face, I would be gagging or crying mm -hmm. because I felt like I was being raped because yeah. I did not want to be doing it and I didn't want to be feeling the things in my body that I was feeling because um, I was honestly like disgusted by the person that I was having to shoot with because you don't get to choose right. so it's just stuff like that that can be very damaging and it's not it's not the other people's fault um it's just a huge problem that there's not really anything to 
set up to protect girls that are young and vulnerable that don't know how to say no or or don't like have self-respect for themselves yet or care for themselves or love themselves because they've been through so much and like mm -hmm. taught not to. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, I don't know if you guys receive the backlash like, oh, you guys chose to do this or whatever. But when you're when you're in your teenage years and then you're around these these older men, I'm sure they're all older. Yeah, that they're are, all in their 40s. They know exactly like how to get you to do what you want, what they want to make them money. Mm hmm. And then you guys don't even really make much, I'm sure. No, it's pickles. Like, I was the number one porn star, mm -hmm. and my rate was $1,200 for a sex scene. Yeah, and you... $1,200. Yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. Um, but obviously, like, a lot of these girls are coming from, like, small towns. Like, their families probably don't have money. Like, I thought $100 at the time was, like, so much money. Right. So getting 1200 was, like, a big deal. Um... But then I met this boy who worked in, not the guy that I ended up dating for a long time, um, but I met this other boy that worked in like YouTube and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And he shared with me that he was getting $15,000 to pose with a Jeep on Instagram. Right. And I was like, I'm getting $1,200 for a sex scene. Yeah. This is, is not weird. okay. Yeah. And I think that's one thing like this, this industry, like it continues to take off, you know, um, as time goes on, you know, more people are exposed to it at a younger age. It's like a, like porn is a real life addiction for a lot of people. But a lot of these young, young men that are introduced to it, they don't really know kind of behind the scenes what you guys deal with. They look at these girls on camera and think like, oh, they're enjoying it. They, this is what they like. This is, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I think that it's important for people like you, especially super successful people like you that decided to leave, like to kind of educate young men. And I guess young women now, I saw a stat that, you, you know, a lot of young women uh, watch porn too, but just that it's not, that's not um, what it is. It's not, it's glamorous and it's not like these, it's not what it appears to be kind of. Yeah, definitely. It was like, you could probably could not tell at all that I felt the way that I did in the certain scenes because it's a job it's acting and like I had like pre-planned things that I was going to say during the scenes, like mm -hmm. facial expressions that I was going to make, things that I was going to do because it's fake, right. it's fake. And um, I also think like the point that you made that the guys don't understand what's going on behind the scenes and then also that people are like, oh, you knew what you got into and like you get backlash for talking out about it. I think it's because men like consuming porn and they don't want to feel guilty right. for consuming it. And so they don't want to hear that I felt the way that I felt. And they refuse to believe that I'm not like a giant whore that wants to get like fucked by like a bunch of big dicks. Right. Like I'm the biggest prude in real life. <laughs> How did you, did you, because I know a lot of women that, that are in that industry it's very hard to get out or like you almost feel like you're stuck. And the, even the girls that do, they the, sometimes the only way out to them may seem like suicide. Like I saw a stat on your podcast where it was like the average life expectancy of someone in the um, the sex industry for a woman is, is about 37. And the average life expectancy outside of that industry is 78, I think. And I was just like, how is that possible? So a lot of obviously a lot of these girls feel like there's no way out. Yeah. How were you able to kind of kind of get out and kind of just like, I guess, find your identity outside of the industry? I mean, I had to or it probably would have led to that point mm -hmm. of like killing myself. Because um, I started like towards the end of it, I started having panic attacks like before scenes because I really didn't want to do them. And I didn't know how to say, no, I don't want to do this. Um, so it, there really was no choice for me. It was either like probably going to kill myself or just do anything to like make something else work. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was telling my friend last night because she was saying that she's, you know, not really happy with doing OnlyFans anymore. And I'm like, she has other passions that she's interested in. I really believe anyone, if they just work towards anything that they want to do just a little bit every single day, like you can get there. Just because a lot of people aren't willing to 
like work every single day and put in the effort. But if you do, it really does pay off. When I quit porn, I only had like 200,000 followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I met this boy and I was like, okay, I want to do what he does. I want to be an Instagram influencer. And I grew my account to over 10 million in one year just mm -hmm. by literally asking all my friends, hey, can you take a picture of me today? Hey, can like you help me with this? And just always posting, like working on my Instagram. And then I started getting brand deals, um, which sustained me so that I didn't have to do any sex work. Mm. And then um, it just progressed over time with the stuff that I, I do, like I ended up doing YouTube with my boyfriend, then a podcast, and now I'm doing fashion. Um, so I really think like, like it doesn't really make sense where I came from in porn to where I am now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really just believing that you can and putting in effort every single day to get there. Yeah, I, I mean, I find that kind of um, inspiring because I know a lot of people, you know, you, you hear the term selling yourself for fame or money or whatever, but like the fact that you were the number one um, porn star and then you chose to kind of like let all that go. Like I know I've talked to some some rappers who do who do the music yeah. and they talk about how they don't really want to be making the type of music they do. They don't want to talk about the the violence or the whatever. They would rather be a positive message. But the reason that they talk about these things is because it sells. And yeah. they, they you know, they're making a lot of money. And they know if they change their message or whatever, they wouldn't be um, as successful. And it's similar in your story because, you know, you were doing all that. But you decided to step down from that and, you know, try to find ways to make money or find your identity outside of porn. I feel like that um, that obviously takes a big like leap of faith and it's just very hard to do um, when you kind of have become something, but you want to completely shift away from it. So I admire you for that. Um, oh, thank you. And that's kind of why I wanted to, you know, talk to you about this. Um, but yeah, I think one thing that my sister mentioned was as this porn industry kind of increases, um, you also see like an increase in, in just the, um, the human trafficking, the sex trafficking as well, which I find that to be like, I mean, it's probably pretty obvious why they grow together, but have you seen that? Can you speak on that? Or why do you think the rise in porn also equals the rise in the human trafficking? Um, how do those kind of collide together? I'm, I, I personally haven't ex like experienced human trafficking, mm -hmm. um, or the closest like that I've ever been to meeting someone who has was I went to juvie when I was a teen and really like it's really sad. They're some of the most beautiful, amazing girls that I met in there and they were like 12 years old and like their parents had been like pimping them out since they were mm -hmm. like 11. Um, and like this one girl looked like a model. She was so beautiful. And like this was happening to her because her fam her parents did dope. Yeah. And so they were pimping out their 11 year old daughter. And I remember at one point she like, like there was like something on her butt or something. And like, she wanted me to look at it. And like, she bent over and she didn't have um, like underwear on and like because if girls like get raped very young or like have to have sex it can like ruin their vagina and it was just like I felt so bad for her because it she was only 12 and it looked like yeah just I don't know so <laughs> it's the, hard but yeah, that, no. that's the closest experience that I've had with that um I'm not like too educated on what's going on with gotcha yeah Gotcha. You know, I was just curious about that. So what advice would you then give to, so I guess a lot of girls are then going into this industry, obviously by free will. Um, so what advice, you know, being where you are now and seeing what you've seen, um, what advice would you then give girls who are considering going into the industry? And um, there's a few things. One, my experience and other girls' experiences may be different. Um, like I know people, girls who supposedly really like doing it mm -hmm. and like that's fine for them to like doing it and um, the difference between me and those girls that I've noticed is that before I did porn I was only with one guy like I, I didn't hook up with people right. um I still like have to be in love with someone to want to like be physical with them and the other girls before 
they did porn, the ones who like tend to like it more, it's because they're already doing um, like gangbangs in their personal life or like mm -hmm. being very sexually active um, already. And so it like makes more sense to them. They were like already thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were already doing it. And so they're like, why not make money off of it? And it's something that they enjoy, supposedly. I mean, I'm sure like, <coughs> some of them have had like days on set that didn't go well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like, so then what do you think contributes to the, um, to the, the girls who end up in that industry doing so many drugs or the, the suicide rates? Why do you feel like that is so high then? Do you just feel like there's a lot of girls that do feel like you? Mm -hmm. Or do you just feel like, um, yeah, what do you think happens? Um, kind of going back to like what happened with my friend last night. She didn't want to be doing it, but she felt like she needed money. And so like the piece of advice that I gave her was just, if there's a piece of yourself that you don't feel like you can give, don't give it for anything because that's going to end up like fucking you up so bad in the long run. Yeah. And, like I know because I, I gave way too much of myself that I didn't want to. And um, like no money is worth doing that really. Right. And um, I imagine like the girls wanting to kill themselves or like taking drugs, like even just to, to deal with it, like to do the scenes maybe if they don't want to be doing it so they can like disassociate because they just need to like make money to sustain themselves at that point. Um, also, like if your body, it's just not natural for, for people, I think, to be having sex with people that they don't know mm -hmm. and that they're not attracted to. Um, and also like, even if you do like doing sex work, there might be a day where you don't like having sex or you don't want to be sexual and you still have to do it anyway. So it's a bit traumatizing. Um, to share your body in that way because it's such an intimate thing. Right. And it's, it's just not natural to be doing no, 100% agree. that, that stuff. Be. Like, imagine, like, you just meet someone in the lobby and, like, you're not attracted to them at all and it's like, okay, now you have to, you have to fuck them and pretend that you like it. Right. No, that's definitely It's tough. awful. It's crazy. No, it's, it's definitely crazy to think about. That's definitely, so I mean, I think it's something obviously more more intimate but i think you know i'm sure guys in the industry they don't they probably don't process stuff the way females do like they're in there living their best life probably like that's so some of them so like maybe when they first got into it but a lot of them do have problems too mm -hmm. um like there's like these injections that guys have to do before the scenes. Like they can't even get hard anymore. Right. Yeah, I didn't um, hear about that. Yeah, actually. so they have to like shoot up their dick with some sort of stimulant. I don't know what it is. Or I I did date one guy um, when I was in the porn industry who was like a director and he performed in his own scenes. Uh -huh. And they get which I've seen this with like celebrity men too that have hooked up with a lot of girls. Mm -hmm. They get so like numb to just regular sex or um, just women that they end up having like these like really intense fetishes because they can't like get off to normal things anymore. Like mm -hmm. I've met guys who like being peed on who buy cookies with poop in them off the internet and watch girls yeah. pooping. <laughs> Honestly, like, I know what you're talking about because I even in the NBA like like you talk about. And this is why I think uh, like porn is dangerous, but also hooking up with too many people and, and because you get desensitized to the to the normal thing. And this yeah. happens in the NBA. Like I hear I hear wild stories about some of these dudes, but like you said, oh trust me, I know. <laughs> other <laughs> other celebrities too that their fetishes get so crazy. You know, they might be a straight a straight man, but yeah. they've done so much stuff with so many pretty girls, and they have so much access to pretty girls that. You know, now they're over here messing with trannies or yeah, now they're over or here man. or now they're over here messing yeah. with dudes. And it's like it's crazy to think about. And I think obviously I think the porn industry has a part to play in that because you watch a you know, when you first get introduced to it, just seeing a girl naked might might be enough for you. But then yeah. you, you keep watching it and now you're looking at the craziest things and now normal sex in real life doesn't doesn't do it for you. Well, definitely. And also how old were you the first time that you saw porn? Man, my mom caught me too. <laughs> my 
<laughs> but I really didn't want, I just looked up, like, I think I, I probably was in like, I don't know, maybe when I was like 11 or 12, maybe 13. So, so like, so young to And I just looked up like naked girls or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like you like but Google like, boobs or something. <laughs> I was, yeah, like, all I saw was a naked girl, I was like, but then like. Yeah, so I understand, like... But imagine, like, being young and having no sexual experience yourself, mm -hmm. and then you watch, like, a porn scene for the first time, and then you think that's what sex is, like, this, like, wild performance. Like, I think one of the first sex scenes I saw was, like, Sasha Gray, mm -hmm. and, like, she was, like, wild, like, licking toilet seats, um, doing, like, double anal gangbangs, and yeah. so like, this is what I saw, and... Like, I thought when I, like, first hooked up with my husband, which is the only person I slept with before porn, I thought that, like, how you suck a dick was, like, what I saw on camera, which is, like, oh, you have to, like, deep throat it. Like, everything that I thought about sex was what I watched, mm -hmm. which now I've learned, like, that's not even what I like at all. Hold on. So you was married before you went into porn? Yeah. So you were married at, like, what, like, 17? At 18. Oh, I met wow. him a week before I turned 18. Got you. That's crazy. But now I, I feel you. It messes up kind of your perception of what it's supposed to be. And even I think these dudes nowadays, I mean, obviously some girls are into some crazy things, but these dudes that are always watching porn, um, they think that this is always what a girl wants. And now they're going yeah. to these girls and, 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 and not knowing really what they actually enjoy. And like I said, some of these girls are out here and they're freaks. So they, yeah. they like all that stuff, but not all of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I think it's really detrimental to young men. And then if they go and they got a girl and the girl doesn't want to do this, now they can't even really get off to them. Like, I know some dudes that would rather watch porn than hook up with their girlfriend because their girlfriend may not do all the things that they're seeing on the screen. I feel that's like that is... actually wild. That is super unhealthy. Yeah, like, no, that's... Also, I don't know how I would feel about that as a girlfriend. Yeah, you think that's considered... Because I know a lot of dudes, you know, they might have a wife that's ready in the bedroom, but like she's not doing the things that you see on camera. So they're going to sneak in the bathroom and watching porn. As a woman, do you feel like that would be considered cheating if you were married to a dude? Um, I personally feel it might also be a BPD thing, like because you're very sensitive to rejection. But I do get very upset, like if I have a partner and like for whatever reason they don't want to like they like reject me for sex, like mm -hmm. it. <laughs> makes me spiral um so like i can only imagine like if your like your significant other doesn't want to like fuck you and they're more interested in seeing something else yeah it would be extremely hurt yeah and i feel like that happens so and much like nowadays. rejected and feeling probably just like shit about yourself yeah that makes sense um but outside so like now you obviously have kind of turned your life around and you're not doing you're not doing that anymore um did it take you a while i know you talk about how it's it's super frustrating for you anywhere you walk anywhere you go people look at you and they see a, a porn star and you've been out of that for so many years now yeah. um is is that how do you deal with that and did it take you a while to to not be triggered by that i know it's probably you know super frustrating um you know you're doing your thing outside of that industry now, but but how has that gone for you? I used to care a lot more than I do. Like mm -hmm. when I started my podcast with Olivia and Alexa, I I kind of did it in a way to like make myself like I wanted to use it in a way to like show people how I actually was or or like really like focused on like speaking well to sort of beat the stereotype of like being a dumb porn star. Like mm -hmm. I used to really, really care what people think and like trying to prove that I wasn't this stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, and then after, when I got pregnant, um, like the bullying online got so bad with it that I just became um, like tuned out to it and I don't give a fuck anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't give a shit. I mean, nah, I mean, every a lot of athletes have to go through that too. So I feel you. Oh, like, you guys get hella bullied. <laughs> bullied so bad. People like, talk the worst. crazy to us. And so I, I know how that feels. And you really eventually reach a point where it's like, man, I don't care what these people are talking about. No, you can't. They have no relevance in my life. Why are they so concerned with what I'm doing? Like, And also, 
once you start to like truly know who you are and like your morals and values, how can they tell you who you are if you know? How has the, you know, being a mother now, and we talked about this before the podcast, everybody says there's speculations who the baby daddy is. And, you know, uh, like, yeah, I, people are going to say you're the baby daddy now. <laughs> They're going to, like, put side by side pictures. <laughs> I know, but, like, when we were in the playoffs, obviously, like, my teammate Bruce, who, who that's who I met you through, we all were kicking it somewhere out here in LA. Um, but, you know, like, during the playoffs, we would clap, we would just, like, bro, your picture, is this your baby? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but obviously, you probably, I mean, you're, you're keeping that, like, on the low for a reason. Um, but how has being a mother kind of changed your life and changed your perspective? Do you feel like, has it helped you? Um, it's kind of like you, you win some and you lose some, you know, Mm -hmm. um, my pregnancy caused a lot of like health issues Mm -hmm. that I finally like have gotten under control and like sort of those also diminished my mental health, like probably for the past two years until recently, I was in like the worst Mm-hmm. mental health state that I'd ever been in. However, because I grew up in a house with a sister who was extremely mentally ill and it was like very toxic for me, no matter what, I always make sure to never let my son see that and to always make sure that whether I'm depressed and stuck in bed, that he has the best nanny taking him to go and do activities if I can't do them with him or taking him out to dinner because I like I don't want the things that I go through to affect him right. and I really I really don't think that they do because I'm I'm super careful about it um but sorry what was the original question no, I was just curious how just being a mother like has just changed your your life or perspective um well recently so I started taking medication like going to therapy and the relationship that I have with being a mother is just so great now. Mm-hmm. Like I really look at him and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like so lucky to have you. Yeah. Like I just really, really enjoying it. Actually recently, cause he usually goes to school and like, I haven't even been wanting to send him to school lately. Cause I'm like, I need to spend all the time with you. Yeah. Is, it, is the dad like, a, like around for real or like, is it just you or how's that going? Um, just me. He's only met his dad one time. Um, and after that, like the dad wasn't super nice about it. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, I'm not trying this with you anymore. Like, was he more mad about the fact that you like had the kid or like, did he not want you to have the kid or why would, I can't imagine even if it was like a girl who I, who I messed up with and I would want nothing to do with her. Like if I had a kid with that woman. I don't care how much I don't like her. I'm still trying to spend time with it my wasn't, kid. Also, like, it wasn't a one-time thing. Like, he told me that he loved me. Like, mm-hmm. and then there's, there's like, other things that, like, we had quit talking before I even found out that I was pregnant. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, he might have even had um, a girlfriend that I didn't know about, which might be, like, part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it always was just like, I actually wrote like a poem about this on my Tumblr. Um, he never asked me to get an abortion or anything like that, but constantly throughout my pregnancy, I had never seen him since like the night that we conceived our son. Yeah. I actually saw him last week for oh. the first time in three years. But he would call me during my pregnancy like every few months and be like, hey, like um, I'm worried that you're going to like, people are going to find out this or that. Like, can you please like do this? Like expecting me to protect him. And I did for so long, just like out of love. Like everyone's like, oh, he paid her money or she has an NDA. Like, no, I don't. Like that's the, that's the father of my child. Like I'm not trying to do anything bad to him. Like my son looks just like him. So like no matter what happens, I automatically will always have so much love for him because he's like part of my son. Right. I think that's honestly like, that's every dude who gets a girl pregnant's dream is you could just tell her like, yo, can yeah. <laughs> like, <the laughs> you just that, take care of it yourself? <laughs> well, no, not even that. It's more the fact that you, I think it's crazy how you, um, I mean, a lot of dudes would pay the girl not to, not to say who it was or just pay the girl to take care of the baby. But like, you just didn't even, you never have really come out and criticized the father or talked down about the, the father. You've just, you know, been a mother 
Uh, I mean, I've, I've made some jokes online about it that yeah, he's, he's gotten him. mad about. No, nothing crazy. Like, um, like I've made like jokes, like in passing, like don't have kids with NBA players or like one time I, I was like shooting a hoop and I was like, well, I did have NBA DNA in me for 10 months. Yeah, and you got a chip. I got a call after that. He did not like those jokes. You really? Man, <laughs> now that's crazy. My One of my last questions for you is, like you talk about how it's been a process to kind of find an identity like outside of the industry and whatever. And your real name is actually not Lana. It's Amara, correct? Yeah, Amara. So if you kind of like, have you ever considered just going and and leaving the Lana roads like behind and going by your real name and and like, or is I just I just wondered like I thought your real name was Lana and then I was yeah. doing some. Well, sometimes I think my real name is Lana. Yeah, I was doing some research before this podcast and it was like Amara Maple, and I was like, huh, like. And All then my I, friends call me Lana. Really? Yeah. So you just that's just that's just. Um, it might be like going back to like the BPD thing. Like you really don't have like a sense of identity. So I've never really resonated with like having a name. Like even when I was a dancer, I had Sarah as my name, oh. and all my friends called me that that I knew from the club, um, or Amra, um, which is what my family calls me. And I think like when I have boyfriends, like sometimes they like switch on and off from using Amra or Lana. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I really don't notice. And sometimes I actually do think that my name is Lana. Huh. That's interesting. So what going forward for you, like, is your, like, going forward, where do you want to go from here? Like, is it just continue with the, with the OnlyFans stuff and the in influencer stuff? Or do you have other goals in your life um, going forward? Or kind of, where do you go from here? I just, I want to... Just keep having something that I'm like impassioned about. And right now it's making clothes and just like even designing my own furniture for my house mm -hmm. or recently writing, um, mm -hmm. which I never thought that I was good at because I dropped out of school in eighth grade. Yeah. But I wrote a few poems on Tumblr and people were like, oh my God, you're like such a good writer. Yeah. And I never thought that I was. Um, so that's helped me a lot recently. Just like always having a passion. And then like if you can find a way to turn that passion into income, like that's obviously amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but the most important thing to me is just like being the best mom ever. Like that comes first before anything. He looks like his baby daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever thought about writing a book? Like I feel like. Everyone you know, like, on Tumblr is telling me to. They're like, your writing's so good. You have to write a book. No, nah, that'd be cool. I mean, I don't know if you'd write fiction or nonfiction, but I feel like your story, um, it is it is a good story, like, to get out there. Um, just because I feel like it helps a lot of people. When you can hear from a woman like you who was in the industry but has so much to say about what it's really like, mm -hmm. it can kind of, you know, you can't really watch that stuff and look at these girls the same. And I feel like a lot of, a lot of men, like, objectify women. You know, it's just like a natural... I don't know if it, it's definitely it's not like natural, but it's like, like culture. It's society. part of the culture now. And I feel like um, a lot of women even nowadays fall into that, that thinking like, oh, this is just how it is. Like yeah. men objectify me. This is what I'm going to do. Um, or like they feel like they have to like have sex with men to right. get love or. Um, or you live in L.A. and it's even like these girls like I know these girls are out here doing anything for acceptance or job opportunities or. Yeah. And I just think... Uh, or even, like, a guy, like, flies around there, like, oh, my God, he bought me a flight. Now I have to have sex with him. Like, yeah. what? No. You don't think if a dude fly you out, the fuck, girl got to be giving it fuck up? Fuck no, no. <laughs> I've had a guy buy me a private jet to go somewhere, and I didn't hook up with him. He wasn't hot? No, it's not. I have some of the most attractive you men know, I've like ever he wasn't seen. mad. Like, he wasn't mad that you oh, didn't... Oh, um... I don't care. I'm not doing something that I don't want to do. <laughs> no, for sure. I'm just saying, like... Like, they could be mad all that they want, and if they show that they're mad, then I'm not going to talk to them anymore, so... Yeah, that's definitely the, the... I think the dudes that are flying uh, flying girls out, I think that's definitely an expectation. I don't know if it's a good expectation. <laughs> I think if a dude is like, I'm, I'm spending any money on this girl, like... Yeah, like... But she that's better be not... Worried. The girl should <clears throat> not... Like, she should feel like she's worth more than whatever money he spent on it and also not feel obligated to 
give like going back to like giving some someone something that you don't have to give like if you're not 100 sure that you want to have sex with that person or give your body to that person or be intimate with them for like because you really want it mm -hmm. and it's like for some other reason or you're unsure like you shouldn't you definitely should not do it and it's crazy you say that because we had the conference i had this conversation with some of my teammates the other day on the bus we were talking about like a girl who we would view as like a wifey or like a girlfriend like yeah. a girl you would cuff versus a girl that you would just hook up with and we were like okay if she's if she's giving it up the first night like how would you view her and i was we were all were kind of like well we probably wouldn't wife that girl because if she's giving it up on the first night then she probably has done that multiple okay. times then we were like okay then when is the right time to give it up the second night third night like four date whenever and it really is i think for these girls out there that think that they have that they should be giving it up when a dude is pressuring them um or he he does something nice for them but they really don't have that connection yet yeah like dudes aren't gonna view you as a girlfriend or like they would never want to cuff you if you're just giving it up right away so you know actually your advice like you, is really good if you stand on your ground and like you respect yourself in that way like i've honestly never had any problems with guys being mad about it and like i did porn before so people automatically assume that i'm going to like sleep with people or like that i've slept with like all the nba players that i've hung out with um mm -hmm. i've never slept with any of them besides the one that i have a kid with right. um but none of these guys have gotten upset with me for not sleeping with them, no matter like what they had bought me or like we've gone on trips together. Um, they they, I, they tend end to up, you. like we end up having yeah, like we end up having like a respectful, good friendship. I think yeah, and I think that these girls nowadays um, definitely kind of think the opposite. They get pressured or they they want to make a dude happy. Or like you said that you kind of struggle with the uh, the people pleasing thing. Yeah, they think that they gotta make this dude happy but if you really want to i don't know what these girls want some girls just want to be able to say oh i hooked up with this guy whatever but if you're a girl that really wants to be like a like a valued by a dude and not just thought of as like a whatever like an object like we've been talking about then it's not always bad to to you know wait a yeah. while also like you mentioned having a connection so perhaps like it's not necessarily like oh she slept with him too early but say she does sleep with him before they have that connection and it's not someone that you actually have that chemistry or a connection with, then it's not gonna work anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can't force it from having sex with them early. Yeah, that might that might mess it up even worse. But like if you if you wait a while, like now even the sex would probably be better because yeah, you actually got yeah. to know them as a person. So Or you could decide that you don't wanna sleep with them. Like usually yeah. I'll hang out with a guy like four times and on the fourth time I know if there's someone that I'm going to like be in love with and want to have sex with, like if it doesn't happen with the fourth time, I'm like okay, I don't like him like that. How has the dating the dating thing been for you? Uh, like since you you've kind of left that industry, is it is it difficult for you? Is it easy? How does that go? Um, dating was easier after than when I was younger because I had more respect for myself. Um, my last relationship was really good, but I ended up getting pregnant like two months after. And then now I just really don't have time for mm -hmm. a relationship. Like I haven't hooked up with anyone since April, mm. which is like, I was super in love with that boy, but like we're not dating or anything um, because I don't have time. Like I can't text a boy all day long. Like I have to work, I have to take care of my kid. I'm not gonna, go out and leave my child every night to go hang out with you so i just don't have time right now do dudes ever try to hold because i know dudes are petty like even me i'm not acting like i'm i say <laughs> like oh. oh i know <laughs> how do you know i've heard your talks today <laughs> chill no i'm talking more like do dudes try to hold things over your head from the past because like i know me like i could be messing with a girl and i hear some about some she did in the oh, past yeah, yeah. or whatever <laughs> and i like it'll still make me mad i don't know if that that's probably not good but like it'll still make me mad do dudes try to hold things i mean that's probably something that you need to work on you know yeah, yeah now it is i don't I, know why i don't know why i do that <laughs> no no it happens how old are you 25 oh see you're still so young like i used How's to be you? i just turned 27 um 
But I used to be super like jealous too. And like, honestly, it changes over Mm -hmm. time. And you just like, when you get older, you have like a better understanding of like relationships and connections. And I personally, like if I ever was to be in a relationship, I would never be like, even though I don't want to sleep with other people, I'd never be like, oh, you can't sleep with other people or you have to do this or do that. Because I personally think that it's way more powerful if you believe that you have this like, or you're with someone that you have a really special connection with that you know they can't find somewhere else. And it's more powerful if someone, like they have the options to do whatever they want, but they always choose you. 100%. You know, so that's kind of like what elite, having that mindset got rid of like that jealousy and insecurity that I used to have. But guys have held it over my head. Um, me and my ex, we got in a really like crazy fight one night. And actually, I've had two boyfriends say this to me. Um, they would say, no one's ever going to love you because you did porn and you're a whore. Seriously. And, so yeah. then why would they, if that's really what they thought? Well, because they try they? to tell you like, oh, I'm the only one that's ever going to love you. So you have to stay with me. They're toxic. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's no. crazy. Yeah. Nah, I definitely, um, as I've gotten older, I've realized more. I was watching a podcast, I think with, do you know a girl named Brittany Rayner? Do you know who that is? Oh yeah. No, I love her. I was watching a podcast. I think she was on there with uh, Andrew Tate. <laughs> I was watching the podcast and she was talking about just you know she's done some things in the past but she's not doing it anymore and like are women like redeemable like in the eyes of men like if they've done things in the past and now they're a whole different person like you know like you or I don't know if she's changed what she was doing but like her and I think Andrew Tate said something like it just depends on the dude like or something I forget exactly what he said but I think like the right dude, you know, obviously in a mature, a mature man, you know, Mm -hmm. for me, I've had to think about like, why do I get so mad about something that the girl might have did in the past or who she was messing with in the past? Because Because uh, and I'm a dude who she had no idea she was going to meet you in the future. And I've done wild stuff in the past, too. So if if a girl was going to hold that over my head. Um, then I would be in trouble because I've done some wild stuff. And I've definitely been a dude um, <laughs> back in the day who had, like, double standards. Like, oh, I can yeah. have a crazy past, but but she can't have any type of past. So I'm not messing with her. Yeah. But I think, like you said, as you get older and you see people, like, for who they are, um, and you kind of, like, meet them where, where they're at. Like, if you if you fall in love with this person and you like this person, you, you got to accept them for who they are you, you and what they've done. and Yeah, because that's what made them the exactly. person that you love. 100%. All the experiences that they had. 100%. So I definitely think that's something that comes with maturity. But, um, now nah, I really appreciate you coming on. I don't like to keep people on here that long. I just, you know, people that I find either inspirational or people that I'm just curious about their stories or whatever, I like to have them on here and just ask a few questions that I'm curious about and then let them go. So I appreciate <laughs> curious, you. Curious, Mike. <laughs> I appreciate you hopping on the podcast. For Was it inspired by Curious George? <laughs> Sierra came up with it. Because I've always just been a curious dude. I'd always ask wild questions um, and just speak my mind. And, and honestly, it the podcast kind of came about because you know how people on the internet are. And if you tweet something that's kind of like against the norm or you yeah. Instagram something, you get like crucified. And people don't even know like what you were talking about. They don't know context. Yeah. They'll take like a... A tweet or whatever and blow it up so i was like what if i came out with a podcast and i could have like unfiltered conversations or conversations that people are kind of scared to have or whatever and just be like open because i feel like you know that creates a space for understanding and and more so that's kind of yeah you can you can hope so some people never uh, will though you can hope so that people understand but sometimes they never will right nah and you got to accept that but now nah, i appreciate you lana thank you Michelle, curious Mike out. <laughs>